Okay, so uh, hello everyone. My name is Jennifer Lin, and uh, uh, I run the product management effort for the Contrail team. Um, we've got some friends here from Juniper as well, so uh, we're going to leave uh, probably half an hour. We're going to do uh, the presentation, and then we'll leave some good ample time at the end for uh, for Q and A. Um, I, I see a lot of familiar faces, uh, part of the community, so thanks for being here. Hopefully it's a, a good show so far. The, the topic that we wanted to cover in this short period that we have today is really about sort of scaling secure virtual networks. And we wanted to share first a little bit about the activity thus far with, with Contrail and Open Contrail, uh, recap a little bit about sort of the Contrail software architecture approach, and then drill into some of the specific use cases to show uh, you know, what our customers are trying to do um, leveraging Contrail and OpenStack in their environments. Uh, so just a few tidbits in terms of Contrail by the numbers. Uh, the first two uh, boxes there on the left uh, kind of talk about uh, the software development momentum. We've uh, now reached or surpassed 750,000 lines of code uh, that we've contributed into the open source community. And as many of you know, uh, when we made our uh, software generally available, we also released uh, all of our software on GitHub under the Apache v2 license, except for the kernel piece, which is under the GPL v2 license. Um, so with the permissive license, obviously our intent is to stimulate the community and get a lot of interaction, which I think we've, we've done. Uh, forwarding throughput, there was a customer session yesterday that kind of talked about um, the uh, you know, Contrail architecture and, and showed and validated some of this in terms of, you know, we're seeing consistently about 5% uh, within Linux bridge performance. So a lot of people ask the question, is there a penalty uh, for doing software forwarding? Um, and I think so far we, we've been pretty pleased with the results that we've been seeing. Uh, the next two, uh, in terms of pilots and deployments, as well as geographic diversity, I think show uh, some of the momentum. We've had uh, a lot of interest from various segments, and I'll talk about the various segments emerging, uh, service provider and, and traditional enterprise, uh, but there's been a big thirst to kind of get this into a, a pilot and, and uh, into production deployment. So that's been moving very quickly in the eight months since we made this generally available. And then, uh, you know, good geographic diversity, a lot of interest in, in Asia um, and, and Europe, and we've already moved into production deployments uh, in all of these theaters. Uh, in terms of open contrail and the download momentum, it's been around 400 downloads per month and, and growing rapidly. Uh, these are sort of unique open contrail downloads, and even hopefully with, uh, with this week and the, and the conference, uh, we'll see even more activity. We're trying to make it very easy to uh, you know, self-serve yourself to, uh, to, to kind of kick the tires, and that's also been uh, very important for our technology partners as well to get going. Uh, and uh, of the website visits, we're seeing that uh, roughly 50% are of new visitors. So, you know, once again, uh, lots of momentum. We've been working really hard within the Juniper team uh, to kind of uh, do a lot of meetups. Uh, we have over 65 events in the last six months, a uh, lot of geographical coverage there. We've been doing uh, meetups, hands-on demos, a lot of sort of open contrail days in, in concert with uh, other members of the OpenStack community. The most recent one was in Tokyo, and we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, interest there. We've also been doing uh, trials, as I mentioned, across uh, various segments, and I noted some of the key ones here. A huge amount of interest from our, um, you know, Juniper's core uh, customers in terms of service providers, uh, but they're really looking at uh, infrastructure as a service as well as net network functions virtualization, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, in the enterprise segments, the, you know, financial services customers often want the sort of scale and resiliency of a carrier network, and so they've moved, uh, you know, uh, very quickly into pilots with uh, this type of technology. And today, many of them use carrier networks for their managed VPN service, so they see a lot of this as just extending into a hybrid cloud scenario. A lot of interest also from the cable MSOs and in our cloud and hosting uh, type customers. But we've been working really hard to make sure that there's sort of this organic uh, community growing. The, the meetups have been very good uh, and, and a lot of interest in just getting you know, hands-on exposure. Um, from an open source perspective, as I mentioned, you know, this is primarily licensed under Apache v2, and even from a Contrail perspective, most of the software components are based on open source technologies. So as our customers deploy a lot of these open source technologies in their environments, and generally we're seeing OpenStack being deployed where they're bringing up new clusters of very dynamic applications. Um, we also use a lot of these components within the Contrail architecture, and the rate at which this is evolving is, is very fast. It's changing very quickly. Uh, 
uh, the network architectures, especially in the data center where folks are quickly moving away from layer two VLAN segmentation to a flat layer three cloth fabric um, and you know, making their data centers look more like the internet or an IPVPN, uh, which we'll talk more about later. In terms of the dynamic applications, it's primarily the emerging applications that are demanding sort of this cloud infrastructure. Mobile apps, real-time media apps, big data analytics, uh, you know, web tier applications. And as we think, you know, about something like OpenStack, where really it's about converging compute, storage, and network, the role that we're playing from a network perspective is really to simplify the network and open up and expose and abstract the network to higher level applications. So a lot of what we've been doing is really based around how do we create a virtual network level policy and security framework that allows the administrators to uh, really manage by exception instead of managing every, every distinct element or every, uh, every single flow um, and really uh, pull this into a real-time feedback loop enabling a lot of the uh, diagnostics, troubleshooting, uh, and analytics that uh, the administrators need um, and not just the administrators from a network perspective. Now in a DevOps uh, scenario we're working with a lot of much smaller companies where this is a converged IT organization um, essentially managing compute storage and network as one and as, as many of you know the networking industry has probably been the most guilty of managing in a very siloed infrastructure with uh, you know very vendor specific CLIs per device. Uh, so as we raise the level of abstraction, standards-based uh, REST APIs that are then exposed into higher level applications, this is really the, the bigger picture that we're trying to get to using a lot of uh, real-time policies to help automate the network infrastructure in context of the broader cloud infrastructure. So how many of you are familiar with the Contrail architecture at a high level, just uh, if you don't mind a quick show of hands? I'm just going to cover, okay, so maybe uh, about a quarter of you, and that's, that's good. Um, a lot of this information is uh, available on opencontrail.org uh, getting started. We have our full technical architecture spec. But at a very high level, um, you know, this we believe is uh, the most scalable open standards-based software overlay architecture to really drive two major components. One is network virtualization within a large-scale multi-tenant data center infrastructure, and number two, uh, service insertion or service chaining of virtualized services. A lot of the uh, development in intellectual property was really around how do we scale the control plane. And as many of you know, the early discussions around SDN were very focused on separating the control and forwarding plane, which if you look at a lot of the large uh, large scale routers that are in our networks today, uh, you know, from a software perspective, they're already separated. But that notion of pulling a centralized control plane, you know, into a controller um, is, is kind of uh, where a lot of the focus has been so that we can drive distributed forwarding in what we call here as a, as a V router. And a lot of the balance in the architecture is to say um, you need some level of centralization to ease manageability and make sure you have a system level view for optimization within a very dynamic infrastructure. But for scale, resiliency, and low latency, certain components need to be distributed. And so that's the balance. Um, you know, the, the V router is a distributed component. It works in a hierarchical way with uh, the broader controller, which then exposes a lot of the lower level uh, information northbound through REST APIs into an orchestration system like, uh, like OpenStack. Uh, we also support CloudStack and uh, other higher level systems. Um, and a lot of the, uh, you know, syncing, uh, state synchronization, et cetera, happens uh, through a real-time message bus, which is also standards-based, based on XMPP. Uh, from a forwarding plane perspective, you know, one of the ma major goals in order to make sure that we could uh, drive rapid market adoption was to make sure that we could put this overlay onto an existing physical network infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, in terms of the forwarding plane and the encapsulations that are used, we're not religious, but we uh, started with ones that are already supported in the layer three gateways and the routers that are out there like uh, Juniper's MX. Those, those platforms are pervasive. They already scale very large scale networks. Um, and once again, the control plane that is used is also based on, on BGP uh, for federation. So we can capture the benefit of a very mature, robust, highly scalable, and highly per pervasive control plane and extend that paradigm into the data center. 
I'm, I'm moving fairly quickly, I know, but uh, with only half an hour, I wanted to make sure we cover uh, just some background here. What this allows us to do is essentially move from what's a fair amount of complexity in the physical layer on the bottom, where you have now, per host, you may have uh, you know, many different virtual machines belonging to various virtual networks, and abstract that so you're just managing uh, the higher level entity. In this case, uh, think of virtual networks as a replacement for a VLAN. As customers move away from static physical segmentation based on VLANs to something that's much more dynamic and application driven, a la the virtual networks, we can manage virtual networks, which could consist of virtual machines across many different hosts, many different clusters, and in fact, many different uh, data centers. So this method of segmentation, which is based on sort of native layer three IP principles, <coughs> allows us to scale into something like a hybrid cloud uh, fairly immediately. <coughs> And this is with uh, very little change to the physical uh, underlay, as we call it. So from an IP fabric perspective, the only uh, requirement that we have of the switching fabric is that it's capable of transporting any-to-any -any IP packets. And then once we have any-to-any -any, uh, transport capability from a physical perspective, we can be very flexible with a pure software layer um, and, and create and automate these policies at the virtual network level. That also allows us to um, you know, work and embrace the physical layer with the virtualization overlay, but also from a service enablement perspective, we can work both with physical appliances as well as virtualized appliances. Um, and they may be Juniper uh, sort of services, but you know, increasingly we're, we're working a lot with our ecosystem partners uh, to embrace sort of service chaining across third-party services. Um, and this is very important in, in all of the segments that uh, we've been working in. Um, so this notion of sort of federation across uh, various networks, creating this network of networks with a unified control plane, and that's the you know, key thing here is that um, we can um, have sort of uh, a series of uh, segmented networks and unify the control plane so essentially we can share reachability information, uh, we can share policies, we can manage uh, things at a much higher level. If you see on the left here, one of the most profitable and fast-growing businesses for our carrier customers has been IP and MPLS VPNs, where they uh, can enable uh, essentially tenant-specific networks and empower the tenants to essentially drive their own policies, but it's essentially outsource over a shared IP fabric virtual private networks. And so moving that, that concept, and this was driven um, you know, out of work in the IETF that one of our Contrail co-founders, Pedro Marx, drove with uh, some of our large-scale carrier customers, uh, applying some of those principles in a large-scale data center where the problem that folks were really trying to solve is how do I... How do I enable a highly virtualized, multi-tenant, uh, you know, segmented environment while still respecting the principles around network access control and enabling services? Um, and how do I do that in a way that's open, interoperable, and standards-based and allows a smooth migration leveraging the physical network that's already there? Um, so as you can see, sort of taking a lot of the lessons learned and leveraging that so we could quickly scale environments in, uh, in, in the data center and across data centers is really the, the differentiation we believe we have with, with Contrail. Uh, from an encapsulation perspective, you know, we started uh, using sort of GRE and UDP. We also support VXLAN uh, and we use VRF labels to identify virtual networks. And so we sort of leverage that component of VRFs uh, to have a 20-bit label that essentially quickly identifies uh, the virtual networks and respects policies at a higher level of abstraction. So uh, the next few slides kind of show some of the key use cases and how our customers in various segments are using the technology to scale their actual business problems. Um, and the, the three segments, the first one is, you know, our emerging customers. We're seeing phenomenal traction from web scale companies, real time media companies, gaming companies, uh, and web tier companies. And the segmentation that they've had to do and the policies that they need to enforce, for instance, across three tier web applications. The second area is really traditional enterprise, and for the last 10 years, as many of you know, many of the traditional enterprise companies have really been driving sort of TCO within the IT uh, environment for cost reduction. 
And it's been, you know, fr from their point of view, at the expense of innovation and driving and leveraging a lot of the web tier applications and the big data analytics uh, that they now have to really heavily invest in. As a result, a lot of the applications teams do that development in the public cloud because they have an elastic architecture, they can self-provision compute and storage resources, and they can get things like database as a service, CDN as a service, load balancing as a service without bothering an IT organization. So we're seeing a lot of the enterprises building virtual private clouds and moving to this model of IT as a service so that they can, on the one hand, enforce the security policies and the corporate compliance that they need to do to be a good corporate citizen, but at the same time empower their IT users uh, to self-provision what they need to do on demand within minutes without filing trouble tickets, et cetera. And finally, our service provider customers have kind of extended the notion of SDN to network functions virtualization. And for them, their core business is the network and their ability to roll out network services in a virtualized environment using the economics of cloud computing uh, and the principles of cloud computing. So allowing a lot of their enterprise customers to self-provision, manage firewall, manage DDoS, manage IPS, load balancing, CDN, et cetera, is critically important to them right now. They're seeing a lot of you know, over-the-top players start to do this in uh, sort of niche ways. Um, but you know, we also believe that as this market matures and consolidates, you'll see this notion of a service catalog for network services that end customers can self-provision. So the first couple, I mean, we've seen uh, a lot of our sort of emerging customers really uh, very anxious to, within six months, roll out a production OpenStack environment for infrastructure as a service. We've been working very closely with uh, actually a few uh, European cloud providers, um, but that notion of essentially creating a infrastructure and platform as a service based on OpenStack is definitely already in production uh, using these types of uh, technologies. In this case, too, um, a lot of the storage is highly distributed using Ceph. Uh, in many cases, there are no hypervisors. They're using essentially, you know, increasingly Linux containers um, to enable a lot of the real-time applications that their cloud tenants uh, demand. In this particular example, one of the uh, customers of this managed cloud uh, wanted to make sure that uh, they could support essentially 100,000 flows per instance. Um, and this is for video and real-time analytics. So that's the type of scaling that uh, folks are expecting. They don't want to build their own infrastructure, but they need to make sure that it uh, is scalable and resilient uh, in a managed infrastructure as a service scenario. The second one is a major SaaS provider that we're working with. And the first scenario, they were building their own virtual private cloud almost from an IT as a service perspective. They wanted to enable their various tenant groups, in this case, uh, application teams building their SaaS application uh, to self-provision compute storage network resources without uh, filing IT trouble tickets. And they are building this on an OpenStack infrastructure. Um, they wanted to make sure that they didn't have to rip and replace the existing uh, physical network infrastructure structure and they had you know a lot of sort of physical security appliances as well that they wanted to make sure were um uh, maintain moving forward. Over time, they'll put uh, virtualized firewalls between each of these tenant groups, and so a lot of the virtualized services are not a replacement for the physical services, but in fact incremental as the granularity of these policies gets uh, uh, you know, greater. Then when they move into uh, the production environment, they can do that very quickly, and this is sort of the DevOps uh, 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 value proposition as well, they are also opening up parts of their platform to their end customers and partners um, so that they're essentially being uh, not only a SaaS software developer and using virtual private cloud for their agile development practices, but also opening up the infrastructure for their ecosystem partners um, and essentially being a cloud provider at the same time. Um, so they have, uh, in this case, 10 to 12 data centers, uh, you know, leveraging a lot of the existing VPN capabilities that they have, and over time uh, evolving that to be uh, a much wider spread elastic architecture that is hybrid because there are certain bursty workloads that they're putting into the public cloud environment. This all interoperates, obviously, using the sort of uh, you know, IP-based control plane. We can uh, carry a lot of the context from a data model perspective and, and things that we've done within Contrail to, for instance, uh, contribute blueprints for the AWS VPC APIs um, are the types of things that allow customers to, for instance, uh, develop for AWS and then without changing the scripts, pull that workload into their private cloud environment uh, without doing a lot of reconfiguration or rewriting all the scripts that they had, et cetera. 
the next one kind of shows uh, the, the requirements of a gaming provider who is also building uh, a, a, a cloud environment for their real-time uh, DevOps environment. They had uh, grown so quickly, they started out in AWS, and they're now growing so quickly, they're building out their own private environment based on, on, on OpenStack Cloud. Um, they do a huge amount of real-time analytics for the gamers. So as a gamer on this particular case, you get a lot of feedback about your statistics and how you compare to other real-time gamers, et cetera. Um, so they have a highly distributed application infrastructure. A lot of the open source components that we talked about before, um, they're doing uh, Hive and Hadoop, a lot of batch processing, et cetera. Um, so th this is a similar case where the merging customers are very sensitive to latency, especially the gamers. They don't want hypervisors, uh, uh, they, they see that as sort of a performance penalty. So this customer in particular is also heavily looking at Linux containers um, for their virtualized environment. The next category is really, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of traction from the financial services. And in many cases, the financial services are building out their private cloud environment for their own X as a service environment. In the case of infrastructure as a service, yes, it's pooled resources that, that are made available to their internal IT users. And they're doing a lot of work in the platform as a service uh, layer to essentially expose that to their uh, application teams. At the end of the day, they also will create a self-service portal to allow uh, you know, their, their users to uh, self-provision. Um, and they're going to turn IT essentially into a, you know, not just a cost center. They're going to bill back each of the tenant groups uh, based on cloud usage, VPC usage. The complexity in the enterprise as opposed to sort of the emerging scenario is that, as you can imagine, they have a traditional environment where the last 10 years they've been focused a lot on server virtualization and data center consolidation um, and a lot of shrink-wrapped client-server applications. Moving forward, uh, you know, we're seeing in, in Juniper's broader business too a big shift to a flat cloth fabric switching architecture, not sort of the three-tier hierarchical switching layers, but more of a flat any-to-any -any IP fabric that sits within the data center. Um, even within those new data centers, they have sort of a mixed environment. They have got to support the existing virtualized workloads that were based heavily on client server and ERP type applications. They also have to support uh, a lot of the new services, whether they be physical or uh, uh, virtualized services. Uh, and they need to uh, have this work across multiple data centers in their private cloud environment. At the same time, many of the enterprises want to enable their IT users to go to the public cloud when appropriate. Uh, so in this particular case, one of the financial companies had 5% of their workloads in AWS, and they need to essentially see that as an extension of their private infrastructure. They need to be able to support you know, network and security policies across this heterogeneous environment. From a networking perspective, because we can enable a unified control plane across all of this, we can federate those domains and make it actually uh, work as one sort of uh, environment, one virtualized or physical environment. This is a little bit of a, of a busy slide, but kind of shows a, a next level down in terms of uh, the heterogeneous environment that we're seeing a lot of uh, in an existing enterprise. Uh, on the top, what we want is essentially the ability to federate and interconnect these sort of uh, domains. On the bottom, what you see is the physical reality of, of kind of what needs to happen. Um, from a switching and routing infrastructure, many of the vendors are investing in uh, supporting new encapsulation types like VXLAN. Um, Already in, in something like uh, you know, an MX or the layer three gateways that are out there, we can support uh, the, con the control plane uh, and, and support things like VRFs and BGP to manage at the virtual network level. And that is not just for ease of manageability uh, and for policy enforcement, uh, but also for scaling. Uh, in the, uh, in the Top of rack switches and the gateways, uh, the ability to support both, you know, bare metal uh, VLAN termination as well as uh, bridge from VLANs to VXLANs. And later this year, we'll see a lot of the top of rack switching vendors natively support uh, VXLAN and, and tying this into uh, virtual networks in the overlay. Um, so there's, there's sort of several levels here. Uh, we're also seeing um, a lot of customers, as I mentioned, in the emerging space uh, want to enable a bare metal scenario using essentially the vRouter without a hypervisor. And so leveraging things like Linux containers and, and Docker, um, as well as uh, Linux namespaces, we can sort of enable that environment as if, uh, just the same way as if uh, we do today with a KVM or, or Zen hypervisor. <coughs> 
Um, oh, one thing to also mention here is that, uh, you know, from a forwarding plane performance, we support, you know, the IPVPNs as well as now the new standard for pure layer two transport from a forwarding perspective with EVPNs. So today we already support uh, natively EVPN for DCI data center interconnect on the, on the MXs. And later this year, you'll see native EVPN and VXLAN support on the, on the switches and, and the routers as well. So that all comes together sort of as a uh, single infrastructure across physical underlay and uh, software overlay. The other major benefit of, of doing uh, the L3 VPN based approach here is that we can uh, essentially create virtual machines across two data centers and keep them essentially uh, still within a virtual network. So you can see here on top, logically we have a number of virtual machines that sit across two data centers. Um, by using sort of the notion of VRFs in the layer three gateways, we can support virtual networks that span across multiple data centers. Um, and this is something, you know, today in, in other, other, other overlay models, once you exit a proprietary uh, data center, uh, all, all bets are off. In this case, because essentially the model that we use within the data center is the same as across a wide area, uh, we can span across data centers with a single network, uh, single virtual network. It's just a logical segmentation. The last category is really, uh, you know, our, our service provider customers. And this is based on some data from Infonetics just a couple of months ago. Um, a lot of our carrier customers are really looking at scaling these virtualized services uh, across their, their core business. Uh, this notion of telco cloud is really uh, exciting to a lot of our carrier customers. They want to enable both enterprise services for their managed services customers, as well as use concepts like NFE to, uh, you know, uh, evolve their own telco cloud infrastructure. And this is just a, you know, a, a recent ranking, but you can see uh, at the top there are strong interest in sort of rethinking the access layer and the provider edge. So this notion of virtualized customer premise and the notion of uh, the virtualized provider edge. Beyond Contrail, I, I think we're seeing a lot of investment in sort of evolving to the flexibility of a software-defined model. Service chaining obviously continues to be uh, fundamental and is a category in and of itself. Um, sort of virtualizing the IMS core and investing in areas like, uh, you know, virtualized evolved packet core. These are the things that if, if these environments don't scale, um, you know, we'll never get off the ground in terms of uh, these models of network virtualization. And that's why it's particularly key for our carrier customers that we start with a standards-based open interoperable control plane architecture that leverages the benefits of the last 20 years of, of IP networking. Uh, CDN is kind of being rethought also with, uh, you know, not just outside in, but inside out, uh, load balancing and, and how do we do this uh, in, a, in a very real time way. And there's this whole category of cloud brokers that are now playing uh, with lots of data across many different clouds to optimize uh, content delivery. Um, this is just an example, and you know, we have some uh, videos out there on YouTube showing some of the Contrail use cases where we've been working with carrier customers to create uh, sort of a service catalog of managed services. As I mentioned before, uh, you know, a lot of the firewall, IPS, DDoS, SSL services have already been virtualized, and we make those uh, uh, sort of available in a self-provisioned sort of service catalog. Um, you know, load balancing and CDN also tend to, to bubble to the top. And this is really how a lot of our carrier customers are um, using this type of architecture to find incremental growth and grow their businesses faster. Today, as you know, it takes uh, probably six to eight weeks to uh, provision a new service, and that's after nine months of certification testing. So the goal of many of our customers is to get to an agile software development model where they can roll out new revenue-generating services much, much faster. So it's the DevOps equivalent for the telco cloud. And then, you know, for their core business, too, as you know, carriers play across seven, seven domains from, you know, the SMB sort of premise or consumer all the way through the access layer into essentially the metro fabric and the core. And so they're really thinking, how do we simplify uh, what's in the physical elements themselves and push a lot of this into a system level optimization with a cloud-based controller that essentially, uh, you know, enforces a lot of these policies. So we've been doing a lot of work, um, you know, in, in concert with our, uh, you know, with broader Juniper around how we can kind of uh, make this vision of, of telco cloud real. A lot of it, whether it's VCPE or, uh, 
WAN optimization across sort of the broader uh, WAN infrastructure. Uh, you know, Juniper acquired a company called Wandel, which does a lot of the path computation and WAN optimization. Uh, similarly, how do we essentially take a broader system level view, do the optimization within a controller, and then push the uh, enforcement down to individual devices? Finally, a lot of the ability to scale comes with uh, do we enable the right level of monitoring, troubleshooting, and diagnostics? And there's been a lot of you know, emphasis in the Contrail architecture around how do we build a scale-out infrastructure with the real-time bi-directional message bus so we can capture uh, all the information that's needed, either from an operational perspective or turning sort of configuration rules into actual uh, lower-level configurations on the elements. Uh, and finally, you know, a lot of effort in sort of a scale-out analytics infrastructure has a you know, full-scale map-reduce infrastructure so we can do uh, Hadoop jobs on the infrastructure uh, in, in real time, and also enable that a lot of this granular flow level uh, information is easily queryable um, in real time. So I'll show you some, some screenshots uh, there. The, the first one is really to show that at a high level, uh, we have a very large scale infrastructure. We need a dashboard that essentially summarizes the individual components. So in this case, you know, the V routers, the control nodes, the analytics nodes, you can look at the big picture. And within that, there may be a thousand or more instances. At each level, we're able to sort of drill down uh, and uh, essentially see what's going on at a, at a lower level. But it all bubbles up into sort of a higher level dashboard. So we can drill down very quickly into individual traffic statistics per virtual machine aggregated at the virtual network level. Uh, we can drill down into specific instances and look at um, flow queries specifically, let's say, for a specific port. So show me just sort of port 3306 traffic uh, in a time series fashion so that I can look at trends, et cetera. We can also do things like uh, you know, create a packet capture between two virtual networks. In this case, we can say between virtual network A and virtual network B, capture all, uh, all traffic and take it into Wireshark. So that's what you see on, on the top there. Um, so that ability to do the analytics and query specific uh, uh, characteristics is really part of the operational scaling that's uh, very important to our customers. And with that sort of granularity and visibility comes the ability to manage on the business side. So working with partners, in this case like, like Scalar, who are doing sort of cloud management and cost per project or cost per tenant, enabling, you know, uh, pulling in uh, purely REST API information. All the data that you saw there is exposed through our API server. So anything in the, in the UI essentially comes directly off the API server. And a lot of our partners are, are able then to pull it into uh, some of their business analytics, et cetera. So we've been working uh, you know, very closely with our ecosystem partners. Obviously, no one vendor is, is going to do this on their own. Uh, so the ability to kind of have open, interoperable interfaces across the way. We've been working with a lot of the you know, OpenStack integrators. Um, and uh, we announced uh, recently a partnership with, with Nokia for uh, VEPC and voice over LTE infrastructure using their liquid core. So pretty, pretty diverse. And this is just a very partial list of the partners. A lot of the network services partners either you know, CDN or load balancing, uh, we, we didn't include here. These are really the system level partners that we've been working with to enable the various use cases that we talked about before. So this is the last slide. I just wanted to do a quick plug. Um, today we didn't get, uh, we didn't have enough time to kind of go through, uh, you know, really hands on, but that's teed up for Thursday. So we have a session uh, 9 to 10.30, and that'll be a, a hands on session with, with Contrail. Uh, and we'll throw out a little bit of a uh, uh, open Contrail challenge at that event as well. So you have the opportunity to win an iPad. Um, and uh, that will sort of uh, take, take the next step in terms of uh, you know, looking at individual functions within, within Contrail. So I know that was a lot in a short period of time. I think we have enough time for, for some questions or comments. I've, I've got my friends here from, uh, from the Contrail team as well. Um, any thoughts or feedback or questions that uh, you have? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if this works. Um, you initially didn't support VXLAN, and um, it looks like you have it now. Um, when did that come online, and are there any limitations to using VXLAN? Because it looks like MPLS over GRE might have some capabilities for service chaining or something. Um, uh, and then also, how does the VRF 20-bit label play into the VXLAN 24-bit uh, key? Is, is that a separate layer, the federation layer? 
So um, VXLAN, and, and by the way, um, ESXi hypervisor support are relatively recent, so we didn't have it when we first launched in the September timeframe. We see VXLAN as another encapsulation uh, that, that uh, as I mentioned, we started with GRE and UDP because that's pervasive, um, but we uh, you know, had customers that wanted to support a VXLAN environment, so we've essentially um, support that, frame, that framework as well in terms of encapsulation type. What it allows us to do is take sort of a VXLAN environment and map it via the VRFs into virtual networks. Um, and uh, that's part of the sort of you know, L3 gateway scenario that we're showing. There's a lot more detail there that we're uh, uh, gonna put out there. But um, because of uh, this sort of mixed environment, we wanted to make sure that our, our customers could bridge from an existing VXLAN environment and map that segment into the virtual network policies. So it still uses VRFs at, as far as you know, the virtual network identifiers. Um, and as, as I mentioned, uh, originally we supported uh, KVM and, and uh, Zen hypervisors, and now uh, with our 1.1 release, which will be out in just a few weeks, uh, we'll also support um, ESXi as a hypervisor, primarily for those customers who are, let's say, in an ESXi environment today. They've maybe qualified those legacy workloads on ESXi, and they want to pull that workload into an OpenStack cloud. Um, that tends to be the, f the first use case that we've seen, and so we've been working with some large-scale enterprise customers on that use case. Uh, I'm here to, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to check with you on uh, your role uh, and uh, contribution towards OpenStack. There is something called Designate, which I heard is a new initiative from Red Hat, and that relates to DCI, Data Center Interconnect. And so is there any contribution you are planning? Or, and also another question is about IPAM, how you are managing in your environment. Yeah, so uh, on Designate, I don't know uh, if one of the other folks uh, in the Contrail team wants to comment there. I, I think it's probably early days. We probably don't have, we are working with you know, Red Hat as a, as a partner more broadly. Um, you know, to date, our roadmap has been pretty full in terms of you know, what we've had to deliver. Um, so we haven't committed anything to support Designate, but definitely something that we should, we should look at if, if there's a market need. Our customers haven't asked uh, to date for that tie-in, but you know, we've been working very closely on a number of OpenStack projects with our partners. And what about the IPAM? So IPAM, I think, uh, you know, we, we have sort of uh, IPAM capabilities directly in the vRouter today, and we can also work with sort of existing IPAM. Uh, you know, the ability to kind of uh, do the sort of IP address management right at the vRouter is one of the key strengths, um, and, uh, you know, is something that we've been, you know, differentiating on uh, with the vRouter approach, which you can't do, for instance, with Linux Bridge or, or vSwitch natively. Does it support IPv6? We actually, so uh, the release coming up, we support uh, IPv6 in the, in the overlay. So uh, within a quarter, we'll have uh, IPv6 overlay support. Uh, there's some work to do in terms of uh, you know, IPv6, obviously, with the broader underlay. But that's sort of an ongoing uh, investment uh, that, that we're making. So we have several customers who want to see that this year. And we will have that this year in the overlay. Thank you, Anush. Sure. Yeah, go ahead, actually, if you don't mind going to the mic. Yeah. Oh, sorry, can I, can I get him in? Yeah, no. sure. Yeah, thanks. So uh, can you briefly uh, compare uh, uh, Contrail with uh, Open Daylight, for example, by uh, ah. the usability, the feature list, uh, you know, as well as uh, maturity? Thank you. Okay, so uh, thanks. I, I meant to mention that uh, Juniper is a platinum member of the Open Daylight Foundation, as well as a gold member of OpenStack. We, we believe in sort of where there is sort of open interoperability in the ecosystem, we want to play. I also actually uh, sit on the board representing Juniper for Open Daylight. Um, and we had just recently announced that we will enable the southbound plugin to Contrail from Open Daylight. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of customers wanting to have the flexibility and not necessarily make a binding decision right now. So we're we're doing you know, our part to uh, federate and interoperate with those various environments. And as open daylight evolves, um, you know, uh, there are now a number of sort of overlays that are also participating in, in open daylight. It started initially with uh, not as much focus on, on the overlay model, but I think as this evolves, we're seeing a lot of traction even within the context of open daylight around overlays. So we, we you know, 30 vendors in that organization were uh, interacting with a lot of the same vendors that we are you know, in the Neutron uh, discussions in the forums of Open Daylight. And that will, uh, I think, continue to evolve. It's still early days. Yes? Um, wh what was the thinking behind using uh, BGP for the control, uh, other than the commercial reasons? As opposed to X for the control plane? Yeah. 
Okay, so, uh, well, I think one of the major things is that, uh, you know, it's open standards based, highly pervasive across the IP networks today, uh, proven to scale, uh, horizontally scale, and have high levels of resilience. Um, those are, you know, primary reasons. It's, uh, you know, it's the balance between does it fit the need and do we have to wait another five years before this technology is pervasive? Maybe I'll, I'll open it up to anyone else who wants to chime in in terms of why, why BGP. Um, no? Okay, I think those are some, some fairly good reasons. But in the standards bodies, uh, there was a lot of discussion about does it fit the need? And that's obviously a, a very uh, active discussion. It, you know, if it meets the need, leverage an existing uh, technology so that we don't have to rip and replace and we can get going with sort of these new use cases. Yes. Um, how easy it is to port application between uh, open contrail and open daylight? So that's why we've enabled and, you know, we, we've invested uh, specifically because we had a lot of, you know, our customers that were sort of kicking the tires on a number of, of options and we didn't want to pose open contrail, you know, as a direct sort of separate competitor or uh, distinct, distinct um, uh, alternative. However, the approaches are, you know, somewhat different. So today, in terms of the southbound plug-in, the interfaces that are there are still, still relatively uh, simple in terms of L2 interfaces. Similar thing with Neutron. When, when Neutron discussion started, it was essentially VLAN-based. And now we're seeing, you know, much more of a discussion about how to support native layer 3 um, models and, and uh, do, do it at sort of a lower level of granularity in the, uh, with or without hypervisors. So I think we see a similar transition and evolution in, in open daylight, but for what folks are doing with open daylight today, there's no porting. So what you can do in open daylight via the southbound plugins that we're enabling, you can meet that use case within, you know, from within uh, open contrail. So northbound, a lot of the early discussions in open daylight when it kicked off uh, several months ago is what is the northbound abstraction for the network? And now I think there's been a lot of cross-pollination between OpenStack and daylight, certainly probably more than when open daylight started. Um, you know, the Neutron APIs, which Contrail also is, you know, committed to supporting, are also what's being exposed as the northbound APIs from within open daylight. So there's sort of a, you know, a good leverage between the two of them, and that's where, you know, it, it's very easy for us to uh, actively participate there. Any other comments from anyone? Questions? Okay, so we, we very much encourage you to join us in uh, the journey moving forward. We've tried to be uh, very open and transparent with the information that we put out there, uh, but please keep sort of an, an open dialogue. There's various mailing lists and archives, ways to get in touch with us, and thank you for your support. All right.